Yes, well, uh, thank you very much. I was actually very impressed with uh, Dirk's presentation, and he's, he's almost convinced me he's right. This, this concept is not worth considering. <laughs> actually, I was reading his paper last night, and um, I read it a couple of times, and I realised actually it's very good motivation for our current paper. So we're going to be talking to you a little bit more, Dirk. What Dirk's saying is, of course, right, because there are quite a few problems with this concept. But where our paper is a little different is that we're trying to look at it more from an empirical perspective and bring some element of tangibility to the concept. It's a very nebulous, amorphous concept. And if you read Porter and Kramer's article, well, you, you can't help feel this is another, another great paper for them to generate another 10 years of consulting money and all the rest. So I, do, I, I actually do understand the cynicism behind it all. But um, I guess it, you also brought out some of the great strengths of it too, Dirk, and that's what I liked about your paper and about your presentation today. Um, this paper, interesting, was uh, developed with um, Chris Wright, who's in organisational studies, I'm in accounting, and uh, Melinda over there, who's with Net Balance Foundation. So we kind of worked together from sort of quite different backgrounds. And I think that was a great way to go because the way we built the proxy for CSV, the way we constructed it and analysed it, it was coming from quite different sources. So um, I think it was a, ra a rather novel way to go about the projects. We have to test this with our journal editors when we try to get this published, but um, I, I think it actually added a lot of value having um, a consulting business work with us. <clears throat> so actually, uh, Dirk said a lot of this already. Uh, what is creating share value? How to fix capitalism and unleash a new wave of growth and consulting money for Porter. Um, I, I, th I was quite impressed with the article overall. It, it, it does seem to bring up some new concepts and new ways. I mean, I would probably agree with Friedman too that you haven't figured out how to make money out of out of social welfare or social so, social business or social relations. Um, there's something wrong with that. Okay, so I, I, I think that side of it is probably pretty old, and I think it has been in the literature since the 1970s. Um, just going through what Porter and Kramer's original concept is, just the, you look at the bolder part, I can fight, good. Share value is not social responsibility, philanthropy, or even sustainability, but a new way to achieve economic success. So it's really the marrying of business priorities, business objectives, with social goals and social outcomes. And this is what's really quite interesting. But what attracted us to the study is, well, implied in the Porter and Kramer's uh, notion of shared value, creating shared value, is that businesses should actually benefit financially by doing this. It should actually be economically benefit. If we find firms um, are doing very well in CSV and are rated quite highly by us, we would kind of expect there to be some kind of economic and perhaps also market benefit as well. So this is really what we're looking at in this paper. So it's a quite a different perspective from Dirk. Dirk's coming from a very interesting conceptual perspective. We're coming more from an empirical perspective. And just to, just to recap, Dirk, I know you've already covered this. What is it actually? It's uh, uh, Porter, Porter and Crane broke it down to three concepts, uh, reconceiving products and markets. That's identifying societal needs, benefits, and, and uh, harms that can, uh, through innovation, developing new or reassessing existing products and markets, redefining productivity in the value chain, and enabling cl uh, local cluster development. You were right, actually, I think, Dirk, in some of your, your comments about this, how this, this actually does dovetail into other literatures, and I think actually operationalising is quite difficult. And when we developed our proxy, we had to think very, very hard about what proxy measures were going to go in to capture these dimensionalities of, of, of CSV. That's why you've got to read the paper <laughs> and help us with it. <laughs> OK, so um, what are we trying to do in this paper? As I said just earlier, we believe that actually if you're, uh, if you're engaged in CSV, you should actually enjoy finan better financial performance. This is a link. For those of you who are aware of the CSR literature, there's been a, a myriad of different studies trying to look at the um, statistical association between finance performance and sustainability. And there's been millions of studies. Many of these studies actually are not very well done from a statistical or econometric point of view. They're using single cross-sections of data. They use very simple correlation metrics or a simple regression. And it doesn't really tell you that much. And we try to improve on all of this. In this study, we're using five years of panel data um, collected from a customised database provided by CARE. We try to actually rectify quite a number of, of the methodological problems so that we can get a bit more confidence about the relationship between financial performance and CSV. So what we're trying to do here, the objects of our study, and the light will come on, is examine the association between CSV and financial performance and market returns. 
Um, the hard part here is number two, develop a proxy measure of CSV based on sustainability attributes extracted from the CARE database. CARE is the centre of, is that right? Uh, the centre of, of ethical research, what's the A? Australian, right. centre of a Australian ethical research. But they actually feed off the IRIS database, which you may have heard of in London. They actually, I think they're almost like subcontractors here and sell it here in Australia. And finally, determine, the most importantly, I think number three, is determine the causal direction of the association. Does higher CSV lead to better financial performance or is it vice versa? I mean, if you look at some of the literature, it seems that companies are doing financially very well and are very well managed and are doing well on the stock market seem to have a bit of discretion, a bit of, um, you know, a bit of strategic discretion, if you like, to actually engage in sustainability and, and CSV. We just finished a book recently that was very much down those lines, that well-off banks and some leading uh, top Australian blue chip companies um, have been getting into sustainability. And I think that th touches on your point, Dirk, about the little games and the little, the little plays and the little um, disclosures I like to have, but you do wonder how much of it is really is some kind of greenwashing and how serious it is. So this book just came out, it had a green tie, I'm wearing a black one today, but the cover of the book had a green tie and a corporate guy adjusting his tie. And the symbolism there was um, trying to meet social expectations, projecting the right image, but within the organisation we found the, the measurement of sustainability actually was really quite poor, it wasn't integrated into decision making, wasn't used in the systems of the, of, of the companies, and so it was pretty much persona non grata really in the organisation itself. So it's just something that was really projected on the outside, and that's why we call it the reality and the rhetoric. There was far more rhetoric than reality um, in sustainability reporting. I mean, that book's just been published by the Sydney University Press um, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. So that's the focus. So what is our sample? So this is a very different kind of talk from, from Dirks. Um, the sample was actually uh, the 287 of Australia's largest companies. And we sampled over a five-year period, 2008 to 2012 inclusive. We took a large number of financial and market variables which are extracted from the Thomson Reuters database, which is a leading global provider of corporate financial data. Um, the real issue here was how to construct a CSV uh, proxy. Now, we explained this a lot in the paper. If anyone wants a copy of the paper, we'd be very happy to, to email it to if you're interested. Um, but basically, we took CARE's um, database, which is linked to the Ethical Investment Research Services uh, IRIS, uh, which is based in London. And the data consists of over 150 qualitative sustainability performance measures for the AXX300, the top AXX300 companies, for, for our sample period. And CARE's database covers issues of environment, governance, human rights, employees, um, customers and suppliers and products. And this is where we use Melinda and her colleagues. They, they reviewed those 150 sustainability um, metrics and they got it down to 26 metrics that they felt most married up with the Porter and Kramer concept. Okay, so um, they were a little, little bit unbalanced. I mean, think for an, um, enabling local clusters, maybe we only have about six or seven uh, indicators, and, and for other indicators, there are more. But basically, we aggregated it up into an index, and then we used that index to run in our regression models on financial and market variables. That's essentially what the approach was. So how do CARE's uh, methodology works? Um, you have to read a little bit into their methodology. Um, they rate each of the 150 variables against a score of minus three to plus three. Plus three is positive, most positive, sorry, minus three is most negatives. The ratings is based on CARE's uh, assessment of publicly available data. Um, and they claim to use international databases and each company is actually invited to comment on its own ratings. I don't know how many companies actually do comment on their own rating and how many get a ratings change, I don't know, we haven't looked that closely at it. But their, their approach seems a little bit more rigorous than what you see in typical academic studies where a typical academic will hire a research assistant and go, trawl through many, many companies and develop an index and then um, get an overall score. Here we've, we've used a company that specialises in this kinds of ratings. They seem reasonably rigorous in what they do, they use interviews, they use surveys and they have a, seem to have a fairly robust uh, process. So. We thought by not, not doing this ourselves, but having a company actually doing it and, and having a consulting company to do the final compilation for us, the, the final um, subset of data, that variables, um, we can come up with a reasonably good a reasonably good first proxy, if you like, of CSV. There hasn't been any other proxies that we know of have been developed. This is really the first one, and this is really where the contribution of the study is, is in this proxy measure. 
So as I say, the second, um, the second test here was to select from the 150 measures uh, all the CSV type measures, and this is where net balance really was of great assistance. Care was too, I think Care also got involved and looked over our final selection, and that's, they seemed to think that was a reasonable selection as well. So as I said, the scoring system is, uh, we developed an index, so we had basically, um, going from minus three to plus three, the variable range of the index is from a maximum of 78, to a minimum of 978, so that's 26 measures. Oops, sorry. That's uh, 26 measures times three and 26 times minus three. That's the range of the index. And that's that's basically, if you know about statistical modeling, that's a dependent variable in the model. And here you can see a little bit more detail on, on the um, on the CARES grade, which is plus three. Medium and positive is plus two, low positive is plus one, low and negative is minus one, and so on and so forth. Again, more, if you want more detail about all of this, please, I'll send you the paper. And again, we used a large number of financial and market variables um, taken from the Reuters database. So what we did, we basically had that index, we then got all the financial market variables and put all that data together. And you have here um, cash flow measures, I think cash flow, performance measures, profitability, liquidity, capital structure, activity variables, and many others. We also used a range of control variables, um, such as firm size and industry effects. Obviously in Australia you've got the mining sector, the materials and energy sectors, which tend to disclose, have a lot more information uh, because of regulation. We had another um, control variable called the earnings management proxy. This, this tends to detect when, a man when a, uh, companies are actually managing their earnings. So we find that actually higher rates of return are positively correlated with CSV activity. We want to control for that and make sure the company isn't actually just man using, uh, managing short-term accruals to boost profitability. So it's very important to have that in the model itself. And so basically this is the, this is the overall result. So it's a little bit hard to see. But this is the overall regression model, which shows you the performance of all the variables. And as you can see, we've got a number of very, very strong results. Maybe I can get them all here, me. Um, these are the variables here, cash flow return, step to cash flow, free cash flow per share, leverage, uh, a lot of capex, we put capex in because companies are spending a lot on their capital expenditure and tend to be concerned about their growth, future growth. And it's, it's, it's a widely used measure in the literature. We have here the earnings management proxy, retained earnings and total assets, that shows you how much accumulated profitability the firm has, and it's also a proxy for the age of the firm. Rate of return on assets, an important measure. Sales turnover, sales and total assets. Log of intangibles, market cap, and, and raw stock returns. If you look at, I don't know if amongst you who are, who are statisticians who understand regression models, but if you look at particularly at the standard key value here, you see that just that all of them are statistically significant. Over 1.96 means the model is significant. We have an adjusted ask over 54% shows that the overall model is fitting the data very well. We also ran various robustness and robustity values here, which didn't change very much from the standard T values. They are also very highly significant. Importantly, too, that the signs of the parameters, if you look at whether minus or plus, they seem very logical. If you focus just on the return on assets, here, it's got a T value of 3.95, sorry, here, yeah, uh, sorry, from standard 3.603, which is positive, which indicates that higher rate of return on assets is positively correlated with our CSV index. And if you go for many of these measures, that makes, it kind of makes sense that even market cap has a positive uh, parameter estimate here. Uh, basically, higher market cap, the more, the higher the rating on CSV activity, okay? With leverage, it's got a negative parameter, so which means that lower leverage is uh, associated with um, higher CSV activity. Remember that our index is the CSV uh, proxy that we've developed from all of those measures. So when you go through a lot of these, a lot of these, also notice too the earnings management proxy is a control that's not having an effect on the return on access. It's, it's basically higher, more profitable companies tend to have higher CSV activity and better cash flow companies we notice the same result, but the values are slightly bigger. On the right-hand side of the table, we have all, a lot of our, um, our diagnostics. Various, variant, the diff is the variance inflation factor, and you look to see whether they're okay, because if they get too high, we could have linearity problems with our model, which can undermine, basically, the reliability of the model and the interpretations we make. So all those figures are put there 
so you can see that the model is, is reasonably is reasonably robust, and we've run the, ro the, the robust yeast statistics because we're running panel data. We correct um, we correct the standard errors, the heteroskepticity, and autocorrelation, and we still get quite significant results that are very consistent with the standard model. And the reason why we do all of that is to, is to suggest that we do have a, a good model. Behaviorally, it does seem to be picking up something important in the underlying data. And that's why we do all of these diagnostics on it. The paper shows a lot more diagnostics. This is roughly it. Yeah. So what we're getting from this is basically, yep, yeah, it seems to fit into the data very well. A lot of financial, and also the market returns here, right down the bottom here, you notice there's a negative parameter match. Indicates that higher CV, CSV companies with higher CSV activity have lower market returns. Okay, so the, the market doesn't necessarily reward these companies. This is a crude indicator. We're only getting a very rough measure here of market returns. We've been introduced various requirements. But we have actually found this in many, many other studies that, um, that this parameter tends to be negative, even as in any kind of CSR context. But if you're a great CSR disclosure, a disclosing firm, or a CSB disclosing firm, or involved in activity, sorry, um, the, the market's not necessarily going to reward you. Okay? It's just one of these interesting results that we keep getting in all our studies. Okay. So we also looked at relative influence. Um, for those of you who are not quantitatively minded, you might want to take a quick power nap and go to sleep. It's okay with me. I'll wake up shortly though. Okay. But all this is showing you is which variables influence the model the most. And you can see here the log of um, CapEx, market cap, uh, investment in tangibles, the earnings factor proxy, free cash flows, gearing, and other variables. This is the this is this is the overall effect on the R square of the model. So the capex one is a very big one. So companies that um, you know modernising the equipment, um, are, are investing for their futures, tend to be high high CSV activity type companies. Uh, capex is also um, it's also a proxy for financial distress. You know when a company is getting into trouble when it starts cutting its capex um, because it's not planning for its future, it's not it's not investing in its future growth, and we often use capex as a proxy for financial distress. So these what was it seems to show that the high CSB companies are strong financial companies. They seem to be very well managed companies. Um, they have very good cash flow. They have very good accumulated profitability. They have very good rates of return. They have very good sales turnover. So they're pretty solid good companies. The real issue we were tackling in the paper, or I think I've got too much longer. Two minutes! Okay. <laughs> you should have told me earlier. All right, we'll be very, very quick from here. Um, we're really looking at the causal relationship. Which way does the direction go? Is it CSV activity leading to better financial performance, a la Porter and Kramer? That's what they're really implying. It should actually benefit you financially. Or is it really that you're, if you're a large company, well managed with strong financial performance, you are getting more involved in CSVs, in CSV activity. Okay, so it's really a bit of a chicken and the egg argument. And for that, we use the Granger test of causality, a very well established test for looking at causality. Um, I won't go into all the technical um, issues with, with the Granger test, but basically, we're using one series here, where one series of data predicts, predicts well um, the other, another series of data. It's a bivariate test. And vice versa. So, does CSV predict, say, rate of return? Or does rate of return better predict CSV over the five year period? And overwhelmingly, we found that actually um, it wasn't CSV that was doing the, doing the predicting. If you're, if you're a strong financial performing company, a larger company, then that predicts your future CSV. If you look at all these tests here, the range of tests here, all corroborate this point. So the results show that CSV scores do not appear to lead to higher market capitalization, but rather higher levels of market capitalization and leads to more CSV activity. But we found this just for all the measures. The relationship seems to be going only in one direction. Okay? So that led us to believe, well, led us to a couple of conclusions about the overall results. Here are some of the conclusions. But I think if I only got a minute left, I might just go down to the one that so what we're saying is our study provides a first attempt to quantitatively test uh, the CSD claim that, that uh, business that focus on social and environmental issues will achieve improved financial performance. Our findings do find a strong relationship between CSD type activities and superior financial performance. That, I think, is indisputable. We ran many, many robustness tests on that. However, our causality analysis indicates that it may just be a case of large 
well-managed companies with deeper pockets engaging in greater CSV activity because they had the greater financial discretion to do so, rather than the CSV itself leading to superior financial performance. So our final line here, uh, we need actually further work to demonstrate that CSV goes beyond the adoption of a fashionable concept uh, by already very successful companies. Okay, so really we're, we're we really do see the need for more research here. So we've got some, we've got some interesting results, but I think the causality tests um, don't provide a lot of evidence that CSV is the real driver here. And this also is, tends to be consistent with some previous literature, which has shown that basically if you're, if you're a well-heeled company, um, a large company, you've got a bit of discretionary cash flow, you will do, um, you, you'll get involved in CSR some way because you have the discretion to do so. Companies of less discretion don't get so heavily involved. That's what, the, that's what the model seems to be showing. Great. Thank you, Stuart.